Have you ever lost something and then got totally frustrated because you just can't find it? Well, here is a woman who is so desperate to find what she has lost, she is down on her hands and knees doing whatever it takes to find it. Today, we will explore what the artist wants you to see when you look into his painting. Who is this woman and what has she lost? The Brooklyn Museum is one of the largest and most visited museums in North America. Within it, there are one and a half million paintings and artifacts, 4,000 from Egypt alone. There are both human and animal mummies. In fact, there's an entire mummy chamber. There are also statues and figurines. The most famous artifact is the Bird Lady. This statue is one of the oldest terracotta statues in existence. But the Brooklyn Museum is primarily an art museum, an art museum with many religious themed paintings. Now of all the religious art in the Brooklyn Museum, the one that caught my eye is this one. This painting is titled The Lost Drachma. It comes from a story Jesus told about a woman who loses a drachma, which is a Greek coin, and then she goes searching for it. Now, quite a few artists have painted this story, but what first grabbed me about this painting is the beautiful colours of the woman's tunic. Look at the green and the blues and the red and the striking yellow. The rest of the painting here is quite dark, so the use of colour draws attention to the woman and what she is doing. The second aspect that hooked me in is the intensity and tenacity of the search. Now, other artists depict this woman wandering around, holding out her candle, hoping she will find her coin. But not this artist. Here she is down on the ground, in under the cupboard with all the dust and dirt. She has a candle lit and a broom or stick in her hand, doing whatever it takes to find that one lost coin. The painter is sending us a resounding message. This woman is determined to find that coin no matter what. The artist is James Jacques Joseph Dissot, a 19th century Frenchman who knew he would be an artist by the age of 17. Tissot had a broad portfolio of styles and subjects. He was a cartoonist with Vanity Fair in London, but he also painted boats and social events and portraits of elegantly dressed women. Although he was raised in a very strict Christian home, James Tissot was renowned for a very opulent lifestyle and numerous scandalous romances. James really felt God was irrelevant. After all, he was living the good life. He was surrounded by famous artists and members of high society. But then the most amazing thing happened to James Tissot. In 1885, when Tissot was 50, he was commissioned to paint a scene that required him to sit in a church and watch the congregation. As Tissot sat in the church of St. Sulpice in Paris, he saw a vision of Jesus. This vision showed Jesus helping a poor couple who had been hurt after the building had collapsed. James Tissot was so impressed by the love and care of Jesus, he left that church a changed man. No more interested in painting high society, he dedicated himself to painting stories from the Bible. He went to the Middle East and studied geography and architecture and culture to help him with his paintings. In the Brooklyn Museum are some of his sketches from his time in the Middle East. In total, he went on to paint 700 paintings of Jesus and the Bible. 350 of them are now housed in this museum. Today, you can still buy Tissot's illustrated Bible. The stories come to life as they are illustrated in such a clear and vibrant way. 
Here is a 100-year-old lithograph featuring Moses as he is hurling down the Ten Commandments in disgust after witnessing the sins of his people. I also have here Tissot's illustrated book of Jesus Christ, a book that goes through the life of Jesus scene by scene. In fact, here is the painting here that we are featuring today. When James Tissot's life changed, he wrote a heartfelt poem that expressed his new purpose. So little time, so much to paint of lasting worth, the years misspent, the social rave, the treats of earth. Let canvas fly, be quick to dry, scenes of the king. Of those he blessed, the poor distressed, let my brush sing. One of his paintings of lasting worth is the lost drachma. We asked a few people what they saw when they looked into his painting. <laughs> well, when I look at that painting, I see a woman who's crouched down and she looks like she's hunting for something. What's she doing? And then we see on the floor there, her arms are reaching for something. It's more mystery, what is it? So we're rather intrigued. She looks like she's desperate and she um, perseveres well to, to find it. You can't see her face, but from how she's, um, you know, getting in there where the cracks are, I think she's really intent on finding something. She's got a beautiful dress on, but she's not afraid to get down on her knees to dirty that dress, you know, to reach out and try and grab what it, whatever it is she's trying to find. Kind of dark, but where she's searching is light. So it's like she's searching for the light. I think it's something very, very important and she really, really needs it. Clearly it helps when you know the story. It's just a short story, just three verses. Here it is. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. For me, there are two key points that jump out as I read this story and look into this painting. Number one, God will do anything and everything to save us. And number two, why don't I do anything and everything to save others? To answer these questions, let's look firstly at the coin. I have here the same sort of coin referred to by Jesus. It's an original Greek drachma. Now, owning a Greek drachma would hardly make you wealthy. <laughs> Even today, an ancient drachma is not worth much. This drachma dates right back to Alexander the Great. It's 2,300 years old. I purchased it off eBay for $50. So you can imagine what a drachma would be worth back in the days of Jesus. For you and I, just loose change. The historian Josephus records the selling of wine to a soldier at the cost of one drachma per sip. The point? If you or I drop one of these coins, we would hardly even bother to bend down and pick it up. We'd think to ourselves about this lady, no big deal. She still has nine left. Why bother even searching for it? It's only a drachma. But that's not what this woman is thinking. The word Jesus used for search means an urgent sense of care. No matter how long it took, no matter what the cost, this woman would not stop searching until she found it. So let's imagine the final scene. After a long, most likely frustrating search, she found the lost coin. Here it is. Then the Bible said she called all the women of the neighbourhood around and threw a party to celebrate. You think of it. She goes out onto the streets and her village and she shouts out, big news, come for a party, let's celebrate. She knocks on every door. Come quickly. Oh, I'm so excited. You're not going to believe what's happened to me. This is the happiest day of my life. So here come all these women turning up to the party with great anticipation. 
I wonder what the big news is. Maybe it's her birthday. Maybe it's her anniversary. Don't tell me she's having a baby. Maybe she's moving out of this dump village into a new home. Maybe she's found a fortune. So they all turn up and as they wait with bated breath for the mind-blowing news, this woman says, OK, let me share with you the big news. I have found a drachma. Now, you may think that this must be a pretty boring village if the hottest news in town is finding one drachma. But that's the point. This woman probably spent more money on the party than what the coin was worth. Because for this woman, this insignificant little coin was worth everything. So how can we apply this story to our life today? What is Jesus saying to you and me? What does James Tissot want us to feel as we look into his painting? Firstly, that lost coin could be you. You may be lost, covered with the dust of life and feeling like no one even knows or cares you exist. Like that coin, you can't find yourself. Or like that coin, you may not even know you're lost. And secondly, the woman represents a loving God who sees you as so important to him, no matter what others think of you, to him you're priceless. The key point from this story is this. No matter what it costs or how long it takes, God has dedicated every part of his being to find you, pick you up and keep you close by his side forever. James Tissot wants you to look into his painting and he wants you to feel so loved and valued by God, you just can't help but love him in return. Here's another painting by James Tussaud. Here Tussaud illustrates the story Jesus told about a man who sold everything to buy a stony, worthless piece of land. Why? Because he knew he'd found treasure on that land and that treasure meant more than anything to him. I love how Tussaud has this man completely stretched out, covering up his treasure so no one else will come and steal it from him. Tussaud is showing us that we are that treasure. Jesus has stretched himself to give everything, even his own life, to purchase this earth. Because when Jesus looks at us, he doesn't see rough, stony, worthless failures. He sees his priceless treasures. Let's go back to the woman with the lost coin. Every coin has two sides. The first side of the coin is that Jesus will do anything and everything to save us, even if he's got to get down on his hands and knees. But what about the other side of the coin? If saving the lost is everything to Jesus, the question remains, is it also everything to us? Why is it that Jesus said the harvest is great, but the laborers are few? Why is it that so many Christians have become hesitant in sharing their faith? Some never do. Is it all too hard? I asked those questions to some friends of mine and they responded by saying this, we tried to share our faith, but we got so many rejections, we gave up. Others said, look, we're just too busy. I understand that. We're all busy. And probably all of us know what it's like to share our faith and be rejected. It feels like you have been personally rejected. But here's my view. The underlying issue behind our lack of intense passion for saving the lost has nothing to do with the hurt of being rejected or being too busy. I believe there are three key factors that form the underlying issue. If these issues can be resolved, then just like this woman here, nothing will be able to stop us. Firstly, we need to more fully appreciate the love of Christ. Here is a painting by Caravaggio with the title, The Conversion of St. Paul. I love it. 
It powerfully portrays the turning point in the life of this man. In his early years, Paul, or Saul as he was originally called, was a proud man who hated Christians with a passion. In fact, his number one purpose in life was to murder them. If Jesus came to seek and save those who are lost, Saul went to seek and kill those who were saved. Then his life took a sudden new turn. This painting depicts the day Saul traveled to Damascus to kill a few more Christians. As he approached the city, he saw this amazing vision of Christ. In this painting, we see Saul thrown off his horse and blinded. Caravaggio's key point is the humiliation of Saul. Instead of riding high on his horse, he is thrown onto the ground, laying in the dust and lower than the animals. The focus of the painting is not even Saul. It's the horse. You can see this man is more interested in the horse than Saul, as he gently leads the horse away, not even looking at the downtrodden Saul. As Saul is on his back and in the dirt, Jesus said to him, Saul, Saul, why are you hurting me? The light of Jesus blinded him physically and he experienced Jesus right there in front of him. Maybe Jesus bent down and lifted him up. I don't know. But what I do know is that experience with Jesus transformed him. He saw the love of Christ and his life was changed. Saul shifted from being a proud, self-loving murderer to a humble, loving Christian. He cried out, Lord, what do you want me to do? No matter what it took, no matter what the cost, Saul would do anything Jesus wanted him to do because he now saw and understood the love of Christ. And didn't Jesus have a career change in mind for Saul? It was now his job to take the gospel to the world. So with this conviction in his heart, he set off. So what happened? Firstly, Paul went to preach to his friends, the Jews. But the Bible says when they heard him speak of Jesus, they tried to kill him. Secondly, he spoke to the Christians. He joined their ranks, so surely they would accept him. But as he walked in, they all got up and walked out. He then moved over to preach to the Greeks. The Bible says they also tried to kill him. <laughs> Talk about rejection. Try being killed. So he moved into the city of Lystra. When Paul preached there, they did stone him. Now, stoning was a gruesome way to die. Your hands were tied and you were placed on your back. There would often be a four metre tower and someone would climb to the top and drop a huge rock on your chest, hoping to crush the ribs and collapse the lungs. Then those standing around would just pick up whatever stones they like and hurl them into your body any part of your body, hoping to either kill you or leave you there in agony until you were dead. So what happened to Paul? After stoning him, the people of the city dumped his body on a rubbish heap. The disciples thought he was dead for sure, but he wasn't. He was probably unconscious or in a coma. And when he woke up, he was very sore, but not sorry. Instead of complaining to God, he sang praises that he was seen as worthy to suffer for the sake of Jesus. Here is a painting by Rembrandt when he was just 21 years old. We can see the Apostle Paul in prison, deep in thought. Now, instead of worrying about his own difficult situation, Paul has a pen in his left hand as he thinks of what to write in one of his many inspirational letters. There was a reason for this conviction, this zeal, this passion. He saw the love of Jesus and nothing could stop him. When Paul was reaching the age of retirement, I can imagine his friends telling him to give it away. Put your feet up. You don't need to go on any more missionary trips. Just enjoy life. You deserve it. The Bible goes as far as to say that some people thought he had lost his mind because he just couldn't and wouldn't stop saving the lost. That was his whole passion in life. Paul said, look, if we are out of our mind, as some people say, it's for God. For Christ's love has compelled us. 
that those who live like me, I cannot live for myself, but for him who died for me and was raised again. Paul had seen Jesus. He'd fallen in love with him and he just couldn't help himself. He couldn't live for himself. That love of Christ compelled him to look for any and every lost soul with as much intensity and tenacity as the woman looking for that lost coin. Now, you might be thinking, how can I understand this love of Christ? I want to be like the Apostle Paul, but I've never had Jesus appear to me in vision. I've never had him throw me off my horse. Fair enough. So let me be very practical here. What worked for me is reading the Bible every day in conjunction with a beautiful book about Jesus called The Desire of Ages. If you spend time with Jesus every day and get to know his love for you, then that love will change you from the inside out. Then nothing will stop you from sharing your faith. So firstly, we know we need to understand and appreciate the love of Christ. And secondly, we need to grasp the enormity of eternity. Imagine, for instance, this rope here is symbolic of life. The rope doesn't stop just here. In fact, it goes up and down and up and down. It goes all the way through in under Sydney Harbour. It goes over to Los Angeles, then to Washington, London, and around the world 50 times. In fact, the rope never ends. This red and yellow part represents your life here on this earth. The rest of the rope represents life in heaven. Just like the rope, it's a life that never ends. You know what? It's a strange thing that many of us spend all of our life occupied with this little piece here. We work and work and work and work so we can enjoy this little part in retirement. Yet we neglect all of this out here. Life on this earth is not the end game. You'd hardly even call it the start. This is what really matters. If we grasped eternity instead of focusing on this tiny little bit of space, the way we live our life would radically change. Our focus would be to ensure that not only are we in the kingdom, but so will our family, our friends, and every other person we come in contact with. Saving the lost will be central to every part of life. The third key to having a passion for the salvation of others is to understand the value of a human soul. I have here a picture of my gorgeous wife, Coralie. Now, I love to just look at her. Of course, I'd much rather be with her in person, but having a picture in front of me is a good start. Some time back, my wife and I were visiting her parents. We went onto YouTube and we saw an old movie a relative had uploaded featuring Coralie as a little girl. Clearly, or should I say, unclearly, it's very old footage. But it's good enough to see Coralie featured with her parents and other family members. When I saw that video, I asked her father what the occasion was. I imagined it was her birthday. Seeing her playing joyfully with her little doll, she's so happy. Maybe it was a family Christmas. Then her parents dropped a bombshell on me. They told me this video was taken on the morning of her brother's funeral. Coralie's brother, Timothy, died in a house fire when he was just four years old. Then they told me the story. Coralie's parents were down in Sydney while her mum was having an operation. They asked their close friend to care for the children while they were away. During the night, the neighbours woke to see a fire in the house. They ran down to see what they could do. The lady who was looking after them made her way out of the burning house, but when she realised the children were still inside, she ran back in to save them. Tragically, they found her body near the door of young Timothy's room. The neighbours gave up all hope. Everyone was dead. But then they heard the family kitten crying through the window. They figured at least they could save the cat, so they smashed the window to pull it out. As they broke the window, they discovered the little kitten that was crying was none other than a frightened young girl by the name of Coralie. She was saved, but her brother and the family friend were lost. You know what? 
as a child, Coralie did not understand the amazing value of her being saved and the horrendous heartache and tragedy of her brother being lost. She's there with a doll smiling and having a nice time with her family, oblivious to the fact that she would never see her brother Timothy again on this earth. Her mother told me that at the funeral, she thought Timothy was playing hide and seek. He had soon come out of the box. But when she saw the dirt going on top, she became all confused and she began to panic. So what's the point? Here on this earth, we're like my wife when she was a little girl. We don't quite understand the value of a human soul. Our loved ones will not be lost to a house fire, but to hellfire. Now the hellfire won't burn forever, but we will never see them again, not just here on this earth, but for eternity. If we really understood this, then once again, nothing would stop us from devoting our whole life to saving the lost. Who cares about how big our house is, or what sort of car we drive, or what suburb we live in, what brand of clothes we are wearing? The only thing that really matters is eternity. A couple of years ago, Coralie and I decided to track down the man who saved her. It wasn't hard to find because he still lived next door to the place that burnt down. I still remember driving up the bumpy dirt road to his house. It was just a simple house, nothing flash, but there was a hero inside. We knocked on the door and an elderly man, Henry Thompson, opened the fly screen door. He took a look at Coralie and she said, hello, I'm Coralie, the little girl you saved from the fire. He looked at her and he said, you don't need to tell me. I know exactly who you are, come in. You know that after 40 years, that man instantly knew the one he had saved. As we sat down together, my wife told Mr. Thompson she had come to thank him. And let me assure you, I thanked him as well. Mr. Thompson had tears well up in his eyes as he stood to his feet and gave my wife a big hug. You know, if you ever have the privilege of saving someone in this life, you will never forget it. How much greater would that feeling be to save them eternally? That person will thank you throughout eternity and perhaps even more importantly, so will God. God will do anything and everything to save you his masterstroke question to us today is this, are we doing anything and everything to save others?